Good afternoon. Welcome to the Commerce Senate Commerce and Consumer Protection Committee. Today is uh, Tuesday, February 7th, 2023, and it is 12.40 a.m. Uh, this morning, this afternoon, we're going to hear a couple of uh, consumer protection bills that should be part of a short series this week and next uh, focusing on consumer protection. Uh, and to begin the committee, we have Senate File 252 in front of us. Senator Dreheim, welcome to the committee. Please uh, introduce yourself for the record and tell us about your bill. A quorum is present. Thank you, Chair Klein, and, and thank you, members. Uh, Rich uh, Dreheim here with uh, Senate File 252. Um, about robocalls, which um, I think we all understand that a robocall is more than likely probably coming from outside this country. Most of the calls made are from overseas. Why is that? The technology today, you can buy software embedded in your laptop and make calls from anywhere. It's very hard to track down and, and stop this practice. There are over 50 billion robocalls a year here in the United States, 50 billion uh, robocalls. <coughs> Why bring this forward? Most of the calls originate from outside of Minnesota. And I, I took a little grief in drafting this bill, Chair Klein, to be honest. But I, I think we need to do our part here in Minnesota. And, you know, people have become accustomed not to answering their phones. And, and when someone needs something, you reach for your phone and you call someone. And uh, Pew Research had a study um, last year, I believe it was, or 2020, excuse me, um, only 19% of adults answer their phones. 19%. And in case of emergency, someone could really need help. Um, you know, of course, it's your right not to answer your phone. I don't want to... Um, suggest that everybody has to answer their phones, but I, but I do think we are headed in the wrong direction as a society. And um, whatever we can do to help that, I think we should do. And so this is a pretty simple bill. It, it just increases the penalty or gives the option for the Attorney General to increase the penalty. It does not change the definition of what a robocall is. It just gives a little more flexibility to the Attorney General um, under 8.31, if there is a case of robocalling here in, in Minnesota, we can do the right thing and uh, put an end to it. So I, I, I know technology is evolving. And what, doing research on this, it was very interesting to me. One of the first proposals for a personal computer was for robocalling. And now we have it um, on a wide scale uh, presence here in the United States. Uh, there are products out there, um, both for cell phones and landlines, to help slow down the amount of calls. Um, but uh, I, I, I think we need to send a message here in Minnesota that we're going to do everything we can to try to eliminate some of those pesky calls. So. With that, Chair, I appreciate your time, and I stand for any questions. Thank you, Senator Dreheim. And are, are there any members of the public that want to testify on Senate File 252? Seeing none, are there any member questions or uh, amendments or concerns? Senator Letts. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Dreheim, uh, I certainly support the bill. Um, I want to make sure we have all the tools in the tool chest available uh, for the Attorney General's office to, uh, to protect the consumers here. But I, my only question is, uh, how was the, uh, the $100,000 figure arrived at as the maximum civil penalty that's allowed? I, I'm trying to imagine there might be some fairly small operators, but there might be some multi-million dollar enterprises that are doing this as well for whom $100,000 would be a you know, a drop in the bucket and probably pretty small change compared to what they could earn uh, doing the robocalling. Uh, 
So can you give me some idea where that came from? And Senator Drehan, before you answer that, I will point out that the motion on this uh, bill will be to send it to Senator Latt's committee, uh, Judiciary, where this could be puzzled out further, but uh, Senator Drehan. Is it too late to withdraw my bill? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, <laughs> Senator Latt's, um, I, I, I don't think um, there is any uh, standing in which that number uh, no reference in other uh, chapters of law that we pulled that number from. It's just a number we felt was a deterrent and to send a message. Uh, I understand where you're coming from if you're making millions and literally millions of calls a day, like some of these bigger outfits do from my understanding. I can see how their profits would be quite large. Um, and of course, I'm, I'm eager to have your input at the next stop and uh, would be willing to adjust that uh, with your help. Senator Lentz. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Senator Dreheim, well, I appreciate that. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I guess that kind of figure is probably a dual jurisdiction kind of thing. Um, but uh, one thing I'm just not clear on, and, and if you don't have the answer now, you can, I guess, give it to us in judiciary, but as to the other civil remedies that are available um, under this consumer protection statute, are there is there a separate damages figure um, or some other monetary component to those remedies for which the civil penalty would be a supplement? Uh, Senator Hammond, if you need, we could have counsel assist us with that answer as well. So. That would be wonderful. I, I do have uh, eight point three one, uh, which the bill is referencing, which is the attorney general's. Um, just duties. So if, if you had, I did not see anything in the 325E, so I don't know if council has further knowledge on, on that. That would be helpful. Mr. Hudal. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Senator Latz. Um, I would just quickly go back to your prior question just to provide a bit more supplemental information. So in uh, uh, section 8.31, this language uh, that the AG can recover on behalf of the state up to $100,000. Um, very closely tracks language that is in uh, subdivision three of 8.31. And I would note in that subdivision, it caps it at 25,000. So this is just supplemental information in response to your prior question that that $100,000 is substantially above um, the 25,000 that is allocated for other things under that chapter, which might be, um, you know, unfair discrimination and competition, antitrust act, things of that nature. Um, to your current question, are you referring to the the private remedies that are located in paragraph A of 325E.31? Sir Lutz. Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, well, 8.31 includes private. Um, right of action. I see that would be a right of action recovered damages. So I'm, I'm looking through 8.31 right now as well, and, and it, it does. I don't know if there's a separate damages component that the attorney general could recover, or the attorney general's remedy is entirely injunctive, or the civil penalty. Mr. Goodell. Yeah. So I, I think your point is is correct that. There is no cap or specific dollar amount on private remedies that you can, um, a private individual can sue and recover. It's not specifically laid out in statute. The number that's laid out in statute currently is for the attorney general um, under, you know, the, the sections of law that are specifically identified in that chapter. This would be in addition to those specific remedies. Thank you. Well, thank you, Senator Dreheim. And uh, before you give any closing comments on your bill, I, I'm grateful that you brought it forward. I do understand that we have limited tools in the toolbox to fight this, but it's clearly a nuisance that has affected every Minnesotan and has had, as you say, an impact on general social and uh, commercial uh, communications. So I appreciate you bringing uh, any idea to the table. I was glad to sign on as a co-author. Uh, do you have any closing comments on the bill? Thank you, Chair Klein and members and, and Senator Latz for, for your questions and input. Um, I, I just feel that with only 19% of the population answering their phones, I, I think we need to do more 
And the only reason they're not answering the phone, not the only reason, the main reason they're not answering the phone in the Pew survey is because of robocalls. So what can we do to clean that up? Um, I think this is a good start, and I'm open for suggestions as this bill moves forward, and thanks for your time. Thanks, Senator Hammond. I just got a robocall as we were doing this bill. So, uh, the motion, the question is on the motion of Senator Zhang that uh, the Senate file 252 be recommended to pass and refer to the uh, Committee on Judiciary and Public Safety. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. The motion prevails. Senate file 252 is recommended to pass and referred to the Committee on Judiciary and Public Safety. Next up is Senate file 5, and Senator Marty is coming to the table. Thank Welcome you. to the committee, Senator Marty. Thank uh, you, please Mr. Chair, members of the committee. This is my favorite hearing room. I never get to be in here anymore because not many committees meet here. But glad to be here. Um, and I actually brought in a prop today. Don't worry, it's not from on the bottom of any of your cars. The fact that they're in a locked parking garage doesn't protect them, though, because I had some friends tell me the other day they had two cars hit in their locked garage. Um, and it was a condo they had cameras there and the car was in the garage for less than three minutes and hit at least two cars and um, and there's a reason for that this piece of scrap metal um, has something 12 times as valuable as gold twenty six thousand dollars an ounce a few months a year ago or so rhodium one of the precious metals in here um, small amounts of it but you strap something 12 times as valuable as gold on the bottom of your car you might have some problems. Um, we can pass this around if a page wants to pick it up. Um, but we've got a problem with catalytic converter theft. Minnesota is uh, one of the unfortunate leading states in terms of theft. And um, unfortunately, it's a leading state in terms of it, outranking a lot of states that are even bigger than us in population just because we have a big problem with it. And because a thief can, with a sawzall type of tool, um, can cut through the exhaust pipe in less than a couple minutes, can cut both ends off, grab it from under your car, um, and make off with it, um, and then sell it for ranging generally between about 400 and 1200 bucks or so. They can sell the scrap metal for that. Costs the car owner a lot more than that. One of our witnesses is a victim who can explain that real briefly. But the simple solution, this is a bill I've been working on for about three years, I think the solution we offer here is one that the International Association of Auto Theft Investigators says is, would be a model bill for what others should be doing because it addresses all the issues they have. And um, Special Agent Baki from the Commerce Department will go over that in a few minutes. But bottom line, this bill does a couple of things that I think solve the problem or solve the problem of how we get at the problem. It doesn't mean no thefts occur, but the trouble is now people there's no probable cause if somebody, if an officer finds you with two or three of these in your trunk. <clears throat> the solution would be, there's no identification on this. We'd put identification on, not by requiring auto dealers or everybody to label their catalytic converter, because if it's on the bottom of your car, who needs to know? You just look at the VIN number of the car, you can see it. You take it off the car, it's got to be labeled. Our bill would require you to do that immediately when you take it off. And there are very few people who, there are very few people who do their own repair work on cars who actually have reason to take off the catalytic converters. Virtually none of them just saw it with a hacksaw type of thing off of it. They, they remove it in a logical way so you can replace it with a new one. Federal law has required these since the 1970s. And we would make it a crime to possess a used catalytic converter that's not attached to the car if it doesn't have the vehicle identification number on it. And since none of them do, it's just a piece of scrap metal, the 16-digit code, well, if you're taking it off your own car, you just write the VIN number on it. The bill would allow you to do it even with a permanent marker or a sticker or something else to label it so you know what car it came from. A muffler shop, a big muffler shop, might go through 50 of these in a year. And if so, they just when they take it off, they just write the number on it. An auto scrap yard goes through hundreds of them. And as they take them off, they inventory valuable pieces. I mean, things like an engine, they want to know how many miles on the engine and everything else, if they're selling them for other replacement parts and so on. If these are worth 500 to 1,000 bucks a piece, you can take the time to label it. Most of those big companies have their own labeling system, which you can pin it to the VIN number. And so that's the way they might do it. But if you have these in your possession without a VIN number on, 
you're breaking the law. And the penalties would be tracking the theft penalties because that's what the problem is. And I'd care to bet that 99% of these that are being turned in um, by individuals to people who collect them and then turn them all in are theft. Um, but we're simply saying that, you know, if a thief comes there and they write a, they don't have VIN number on, they've committed the crime. If they write the wrong number on, it's committing the crime. And you can tell that. Law enforcement can tell that immediately by their databases. Um, but if they put the right number on and it's Senator Klein's car and the law enforcement types in the VIN number, they can contact Senator Klein and find out, did you give this converter to somebody? And your answer is no, they cut it off my car, so you have them for the theft. So the simple thing to do is label them all with the VIN number, and we would prohibit anybody from not only possessing but also buying one, unless it's got the VIN number, and the only people who'd be allowed to do it would be um, registered scrap metal dealers in Minnesota. And scrap metal dealers would have to go through certain steps, not big convoluted steps, but to record they already have a lot of this because we've had so many problems with scrap metal dealers buying stolen copper and other things. So we have already some things in the law. This would simply require them to also have the VIN number of the vehicle it came from and um, basic things like that. We would prohibit the scrap dealers from paying cash for used converters and we'd require to hold them for a week until, or five days I think it is, until um, so there's no cash transactions. We want to we want to make it so you can track it for law enforcement. And, um, and the biggest thing is that um, if a law enforcement agency finds some of these in your back seat, which I think we may have testimony to that effect, right now they have no probable cause. Here, if it doesn't have the VIN number on, they've got, you've committed a crime just in that. Um, and, and for a lot of people, if you look at Craig's, Craig's book, Craigslist or Facebook Marketplace, you can find all these pieces. We pay cash for converters. And they'll come to you. They'll say, where are you? Oh, OK, well, we'll meet you at the Walmart parking lot at 7 in the morning on Saturday. We'll buy as many as you have. Well, they wouldn't be registered scrap dealers, so they couldn't do that. So it would be easy if you wanted to do a sting operation, catch somebody doing that. So we're trying to catch up on it. And that's my brief explanation. And I'd first like to turn it over to Special Agent Joe Baki from the Department of Commerce, who's been very helpful with this. Senator Marty, before we go to testifiers, can you have an author's amendment? A6 amendment, I'd like to have adopted the author's amendment. Senator Latz moves the A6 amendment. All those in favor of the amendment, please say aye. aye. Opposed, say nay. The A6 is adopted. To your testifiers, please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you, Chairperson Klein. Uh, my name is Joseph Bakke, and I'm a special agent for the Commerce Fraud Bureau. Uh, for the last three years, I've been assigned to manage the state's auto theft prevention program. And that program has, uh, much to my chagrin, included the theft of catalytic converters. Uh, in the capacity of managing the program, I've, I've coordinated investigations around the state of Minnesota and been a part of some of the investigations uh, involving catalytic converter ca theft. So I've been asked to come to give some background on um, how this bill will fit in to help uh, solve the problem. And I can't see what slide we're on, unfortunately. Uh, we're here, this one. Okay. Um, so a, a typical vehicle, the catalytic converter, as you can see in the picture, is, is on the, uh, the underside of your car, and a typical vehicle will have anywhere from one to four catalytic converters on it. A uh, catalytic converter is important because it's an emission control device that um, protects uh, our environment by taking some of the harmful pollutants from a combustion engine and turning them into less harmful uh, emissions gases. You should know that a, a catalytic converter has an extremely low failure rate, uh, and the need to replace one because the one on your car has gone bad is even less because Minnesota is not an emissions state, so you're not going to have the issue of not getting license tabs in order to you know, have your catalytic converter replaced and so forth. I did speak with, with several different shops. Your typical garage replaces about one catalytic converter a month. A more special specialty exhaust shop uh, may replace one catalytic converter a week due to failure. Now that said, when I've spoken with these, some of them are replacing 10 to 15 on a daily basis, not because one went bad, but because when their customer comes in, they're missing it because it's been stolen by a thief. So the very large, large majority of catalytic converters that are making their way into uh, the, the black market or uh, the recycling market uh, are off of you know, people's vehicles without their permission and stolen. You can go to the next. next slide. 
they're working. Just go. Oh, okay. they, they've got the slide presentation. <laughs> so the average cost um, to replace a catalytic converter is around twenty six hundred dollars. Uh, this amount results in increased insurance costs for all Minnesota consumers. And you should also understand that many of the vehicles that are targeted, uh, one of them very popular for a while in Minnesota was the 2007 to 2009 Toyota Prius. I don't know about you, but I wouldn't have comprehensive insurance on that car myself. The repair cost if your catalytic converter is stolen for that is around $3,300. So the effect of having the catalytic converter is devastating on people. It can total the vehicle, endanger the environment. And because so many of them have been stolen, it sometimes is taking six to nine months in order to get a replacement catalytic converter in, in order for the person to drive their car again. So Minnesota, unfortunately, is the third largest state in the nation for catalytic converter theft um, behind California and Texas. Uh, I was asked this morning as to, those are a whole lot bigger states, why are, why are we number three? And unfortunately, I can't give you that answer. I, I have no idea why Minnesota, why the crime has become so popular in Minnesota. Um, State Farm is the only insurance company that I am aware of that has, has done some statistical analysis of this. And uh, some of the think tanks, one of which I'm on the, the board of directors of, the National Salvage Vehicle Reporting Program, took State Farm's numbers, looked at the market share that they had, and, and was able to do a calculation and, and determine that in 2022, there would be approximately 600 to 700,000 catalytic converter thefts nationwide, uh, resulting in repair costs of about $1.5 billion. Uh, so th these are pretty substantial numbers. And, and when you look at Minnesota, again, being number three, people ask me, you know, how many is that in Minnesota? Um, you should know that the very, very large majority of these are not being reported to law enforcement and are not being reported to insurance companies. I would guess that the minimum number being stolen in Minnesota is around 100,000 a year. And I can say that pretty confidently because of the, some of the investigations I've been involved on. We've been looking at people that have been reportedly exporting around 2,000 2, catalytic converters every other week. And that's just one person. And I know of multiple people that have engaged in that type of conduct. So why do we have the problem? Catalytic converters are really easy to steal. Uh, you can take, uh, you've probably seen some of the YouTube videos. If you haven't, uh, you, get, you get a Sawzall, uh, some cases a, a battery operated uh, impact wrench and you're, you're done in less than a minute. Um, there's very, very little risk of being caught and even less risk of being prosecuted. And then they're really easy to steal, or they're really easy to sell. And they're really easy to sell, not just on the black market, but also on the legitimate market because our laws don't have a lot of requirements in place for, for what is needed. Um, the way the laws currently are structured, um, legitimate buyers, as long as they follow the law, even if the circumstances are questionable, are, are insulated. We have uh, seen the Prius catalytic converters being sold for um, up to $1,600 just for one of them. So that's, that's pretty significant uh, profit margin. So why is this important? Um, people look at this as just a property crime. Well, it's gone beyond a property crime. Um, it's, it's now organized crime. And what I mean by organized crime is this is what people's business is. They are making money on it. There are gangs of people that are going out on a daily basis with a team of three or four people, frequently a couple of them armed, uh, and they go out to target stealing catalytic converters off of specific vehicles. Um, they will shoot at people if they're interrupted in the process. Um, and, it, and it's the problem we thought would start to get better, but in fact, it's been getting worse. There's been about a 33% increase in 2022. Um, one thing to keep in mind is if we, uh, the catalytic converter, this, this hunk of metal, it is just a hunk of metal and it isn't worth anything until you can get it back in the legitimate stream of commerce. So the law looks at adding some regulations and challenges so that stolen ones don't end up in the legitimate stream of con commerce. Uh, I, I chaired a subcommittee for the International Association of Auto Theft Investigators and we came up with five recommendations on how to write uh, or how to strengthen laws related to dealing with this problem. Um, Minnesota is lacking in, in three of those areas. Um, the first one is the marking requirement of the bill. Uh, the marking requirement is, it's a unique idea, and it's, it's pretty simple. Uh, uh, Senator Marty already explained it, um, but the, on the, the screen, I believe you can see the, the photo of the catalytic converter with some grind marks on there. 
well, what do you think was ground off there? I can tell you from, from the, my investigations, um, even the black market dealers don't want to buy a catalytic converter with grind numbers on it. Uh, and I, I believe County Attorney Choi will um, speak to you shortly. And, but as, as a prosecutor, a grind mark is a pretty good indicator that property is stolen. Um, so even if they're, the naysayers want to say, well, they're going to grind the numbers off, go ahead, grind the numbers off. That provides evidence for us to prosecute you. Um, these requirements would apply both to individuals and business transactions. And the reason they need to apply to business transactions is because uh, that's what prevents fences and loopholes from happening. Uh, on your screen, there, there's a camp sample of an indictment. And the only reason it's up there is to highlight that all of these co-conspirators are operating different shell companies in order to insulate themselves and disguise their criminal activity. If you exclude business-to-business -business transactions from legislation, all you have to do is open up Joe's muffler shop, I'll take the risk and act as the fence, but then I can sell all of my stolen property with impunity to a dealer up the stream. So that's where this marking requirement and the other transactions need to follow through all of the bill. Um, in addition to those requirements, um, we would be limiting the sale, or the bill limits the sale, to registered scrap metal dealers, uh, which makes it a lot easier for the investigation and, and also the safety of aspect that if someone legitimately wants to sell it, they can go to somebody who's registered with the state. And then it provides an audit function that the Department of Public Safety will follow through with. Uh, the current law does have an audit function, but it's discretionary. And I can tell you from my experience, with the exception of um, a portion of, the, of a unit in St. Paul, uh, there, are, there isn't anybody who is following up and doing audits of scrap dealers to see that they're complying with the laws in the state of Minnesota. Finally, it, it adds a, a law enforcement database. And the database would operate much like pawn shops have to do in many communities, where all of the transactions are recorded into the database. Uh, that database would then allow for a law enforcement agency to um, you know, enter a name of somebody they're looking at and see that not only has this person sold um, you know, catalytic converters at a location in St. Paul, but maybe they've also went out to New Ulm, um, you know, Moorhead, Minnesota, other places, because frequently criminals will that are selling stolen property will move them around to different locations. Uh, that database would also be administered uh, by the Department of Public Safety uh, and, and be a useful activity. There, there are record disclosure requirements in the existing law, but those are really burdensome because they don't have that electronic sharing ability. So as a law enforcement officer, if I wanted to search for one person in particular or look for a particular identification number, I would have to contact each of the 70-some registered dealers individually which would probably take a couple days of my time. Um, the penalties, as mentioned, follow the theft statutes, and, and those should uh, create a su sufficient deterrence effect um, and accountability effect for the people who are cutting the catalytic converters off. But also of note, there's a provision for people who are in possession of more than uh, 71 uh, catalytic converters, which loosely uh, follows along with our theft of over $35,000. And the purpose of that would be to find a way to hold those accountable who are buying large quantities of stolen uh, catalytic converters. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bakke. Senator Marty. Um, Mr. Chair, uh, if there aren't questions for him right now, he's, he'll be around to help answer questions. We have a couple other witnesses quickly, if we could. Yes, who would you like to call up next? Yeah, like um, County Attorney John Choi first from Ramsey County. Welcome to the Committee, County Attorney, please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. For the record, my name is John Choi, and I serve as the Ramsey County Attorney. And um, I want to begin my remarks by first uh, thanking Senator Marty uh, for his tireless efforts to get uh, this bill passed for the past three years. Uh, it shouldn't have taken this long, and I hope that this session that we could actually get a real solution to some of the issues that uh, Minnesotans are facing with the theft of catalytic converters. Uh, I was very involved back in 2013 uh, with regard to the Scrap Metal Reform Act. And when the legislature acted, uh, it really made a difference around what we were experiencing at the time is that this, we were having brazen uh, thefts of automobiles 
because at that time, the, the, just the scrapping of uh, a vehicle was about, I don't know what the price is today, but it was about $400 to $500. And we would have tow truck operators literally stealing cars from people's driveways and driving them right into the scrapyard. And what we found oftentimes was that there wasn't really um, a, a, a regulatory scheme that addressed some of those issues. The legislature acted and it curtailed that type of activity. It really made a difference. You've made a difference around a whole bunch of other issues uh, when you get involved and actually regulate um, the actual source of the, the, the problem. Here, what's driving this crime is the demand uh, for these metals. And so I think the steps that are taken, this truly is a really comprehensive bill um, and it addresses a lot of the things that we were talking about back in 2013, uh, but it will apply to catalytic converter thefts, and I really truly believe uh, that this bill will actually make a difference from the standpoint of prosecution. It will make it very much easier to prosecute people by just criminalizing simple possession of a catalytic uh, converter that is not attached to a vehicle, and then there are protections in there that you could have if you're the, the owner of, a true rightful owner of that catalytic converter. Uh, and I also am here today, uh, and I want to express uh, the strong support of uh, the Minnesota County Attorneys Association, which is an association that represents all 87 elected county attorneys. We took a position uh, in support of this bill uh, quite some time ago, and we encourage you to pass this bill. So thank you. And County Attorney, if you could remain at the table, I think we have a question from Senator Rasmussen. Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, uh, County Attorney Choi, for being here with us today. It's, it's my understanding, Mr. Choi, that your office uh, doesn't prosecute felonies if it's coming from a uh, traffic stop that would involve a lower level uh, violation. And I was wondering, Mr. Chair, Mr. Choi, if that would apply to catalytic converter thefts and the felonies that are created in this bill and how your office would respond to that if it came from a uh, uh, traffic stop involving a lower yeah. level violation. Mr. Choi. Mr. Chairman and, and uh, Senator, uh, thanks for the question and happy to address that. So we do have a policy in our office uh, that would say that we, um, presumptively would not charge a case that would result from a non-public safety traffic stop. Um, and so if there was a equipment violation, so for instance, if somebody was hanging, if someone had something hanging from their rear view mirror, right, and a traffic stop was made for that particular purpose as the pretext for that stop to do a further search, and they found uh, I think in this bill, in order for it to be a felony, you'd have to have found a certain number, right? Uh, the police would confiscate, pursuant, if this law were to pass, they would take action to confiscate the catalytic converter, and then they would do the investigation, and then they would present it to our office. And then we would determine whether or not our policy would apply. We also have a public safety exception to that policy as well. Um, the way that that policy has played out is, is that over the course of time, we announced this policy back in September of 2021, uh, we have declined one case and we have used the public safety exception twice. So what I'm telling you there is, is that for the most part in my jurisdiction, uh, the police are a part of uh, this reform. And the reason for this reform is because uh, what we have experienced as a community and as a county is that we've had um, uh, high disproportionate rates of contact, minority contact, especially in the African American community. And we felt that it was critical to address this issue, but we did this working with the police. So with the city of Roseville, with the city of St. Paul, um, we have figured out ways to do an alternative. Uh, so instead of doing, pulling somebody over for something dangling from your rearview mirror or because you've got an expired tab, we have developed out a, a, a button that somebody can press and then they can enter the license plate number uh, of the vehicle. And then uh, subsequently, like a day or two afterwards, we will write, uh, put that person on notice that they have to fix the condition 
and uh, we can also provide uh, resources and help for individuals uh, through the Lights On program. And uh, we haven't announced this publicly yet, but we're going to be announcing the ability to help people um, deal with their expired tabs as well. The initial results, the law enforcement in St. Paul and in Roseville started this back in, in January of this year, so we only got about 30 days of experience. Um, but it's done uh, remarkably well in terms of building trust and appreciation uh, for uh, the work that the police departments are doing uh, to be a part of this uh, solution. And there's been great uh, gratitude expressed by those taking advantage of this particular situation. So we will be reporting out more about this initiative. Uh, probably in the month of March, we're partnering with the Justice Innovation Lab uh, to do research, to conduct research on this policy and what the impact has been around these particular traffic stops, the racial disparity, uh, as well as uh, the qualitative research. So that should be hopefully coming forward sometime later this year. Um, so I'm really excited about that because I think the, the intended uh, effect of what the, our policy uh, is happening, and we've always maintained that this does not at all impact public safety. Sir Rasmus. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Appreciate it. Uh, Mr. Choi, I appreciate your response to the question. Um, and yeah, I, I would just say, um, I, my hope is if this bill becomes law and someone gets pulled over with 71 catalytic converters in their back that we don't have numbers for. I would just hope, um, not just to you, Mr. Choi, but to our, our prosecutors across the state that they would prosecute and that um, we would take these violations seriously because uh, as much as I respect Senator Marty and his work, I don't think this bill alone is going to fix the catalytic converter problem in Minnesota. And we need prosecutors who are willing to prosecute criminals who are committing uh, property crimes against Minnesotans. And so I appreciate and, the conversation. And Mr. Today. Chair and Senator, just for the record, if somebody has 70 Mr. Choi. Uh, catalytic converters in their car, I think that would fit the public safety exception. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Choi, uh, and to members of the committee. Uh, next, I think we will hear from uh, Commander Kurt Hallstrom with the well, same we have, we have. So Ms. I'm sorry. Right here. Uh, uh, is it Ms. Peltier? Yes. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Good afternoon, Chairman Klein and members of the committee. My name is Carrie Peltier. I live in the Como neighborhood of St. Paul. My four kids go to St. Paul Public Schools, Chelsea, Murray, and Como. Um, in 2021, in Thanksgiving, the first time my father-in-law was able to visit us after the pandemic for Thanksgiving, his car was hit and they took his catalytic converter. Uh, he had to leave his car here in Minnesota. He had to buy a plane ticket and fly back to Indiana. He had to rent a car for three months. All told, this cost him more than $4,000, and we had to drive his then-repaired car back to Indiana for him. Then he had to buy a shield that cost $350 to put it on his car so he could come visit us again. Um, this is a problem in particular to our neighborhood where people are hit every single day. On our neighborhood page on Facebook, there is not a day that goes by someone doesn't report that their car was stolen, and there's not a lot of people in that group. And I agree with it. Pardon me, the officer who testified earlier, this is becoming a public safety issue because people are furious, because some people are getting hit more than once and it's devastating them financially. And so I know neighbors who have chased people down the block and tackled them to try and stop them from stealing catalytic converters and somebody's gonna get hurt until we take care of the fact that there is a demand for this. So I appreciate your time and I would ask you to pass this bill. And Mr. Chair, to Mr. that, I think her story is very typical. I think most of you have heard from constituents on this issue. And, and again, the, it's not just the two to 3,000 bucks typical cost to replace the catalytic converter. It's the hassle, everything else you have. And again, a lot of people, their cars aren't insured for comprehensive coverage. And so they're out in the cold. So. Thank you, Ms. Peltier and Senator Marty. And should we go now, Senator Marty, to Commander Hallstrom? Commander, please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you, sir. Um, my name is uh, Kurt Hallstrom. I'm a senior commander for the Eastern District of St. Paul. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to, to speak to you uh, about the experiences I have been informed about from the citizens of St. Paul. I have uh, statistics just for the reported catalytic converter thefts for 
Uh, the city of St. Paul in 2020, there was 1,166 reported. 2021, 1,877. And in 2022, 2,380. So to uh, Special Agent Baki's point, it looks to be about a 30% increase year over year. Um, the only thing that, that seems to slow down the theft of catalytic converters in the city of St. Paul is uh, the ultimate crime fighter and old man winter. Um, they decline in the fall and the, in the winter, and then they, they increase uh, in the spring uh, consistently year after year. Um, I have uh, read reports and, and heard officers tell me about vehicles in which they've stopped that have had, uh, auto, you know, like the big NASCAR automotive jacks in the backseat of the car, two or three individuals in the car with um, multiple uh, battery-operated saws. Technology has made it really easy for them to, to quickly cut these off. Uh, they, they pull up, they jack up one side of the car, they're under it, they cut the catalytic converter, and they're off. Um, I, have, I have read reports where officers have stopped a car that had you know, two or three catalytic converters rolling around in the trunk. Um, they don't, if they don't have markings on them, um, and they're not contraband, which uh, I really like and, and, and support in this bill that it makes possession of a catalytic converter contraband, such as a handgun uh, or, or drugs, uh, you know. So the officers haven't really had anything uh, reasonable to, to take them for. Um, if, they've had, if they've had sawzalls and things, we could do a different uh, possession of burglary tools, but I'm, I'm sure that uh, uh, County Attorney Choi uh, would would say that that's problematic, and it's not as straightforward as this as this uh, this bill proposes it to be. So, um, the testimony that was that preceded me uh, was very comprehensive, and I really don't uh, have too much more to say than than uh, we really need this bill uh, for the citizens of Minnesota. Thank you, Commander, and thank you for your work. Uh, did you also have uh, Mr. Potts? I believe we have one more from the chiefs. Um, witness here and then other than that I'm not sure who else wanted to testify but that's Mr. Potts welcome to the committee please introduce yourself for the record and proceed uh, Mr. Chair members of the committee uh, my name is Jeff Potts I'm the executive director of the Minnesota Chiefs of Police Association former police chief in the city of Bloomington uh, I'm here today who represents more than 300 chiefs across the state but 150 command staff officers working in police departments across the state. Uh, we also would like to thank uh, Senator Marty for his efforts this year and for the past, I guess, three years as we've been really trying to work on this issue and for bringing Senate File 5 forward as we feel uh, there is a definite need for this type of legislation to address this serious issue. Uh, as you've just heard, um, you know, there's been a massive increase in catalytic converter thefts over the last few years. Uh, these thefts have impacted vehicle owners across the state of Minnesota. Uh, the growing problem has been met uh, to date with some modest measures and a pilot program uh, in the past, but we feel Senate File 5 does take the appropriate next step to establish a criminal penalty uh, for unauthorized possession and purchase of catalytic converters. Uh, we do believe this bill will help curb these thefts from occurring and uh, will uh, appropriately hold individuals and groups accountable for committing these thefts, and again, um, we do thank Senator Marty for bringing this bill forward uh, as we try to address this important issue. Mr. Chair, thanks for your time here today. Thank you, Mr. Potts. And I also have Mr. Cocking. <coughs> Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, for the record, Aaron Cocking, Insurance Federation of Minnesota. Uh, we support this bill. Let me add to the chorus of, of voices that are thanking Senator Marty for the work that he has done on this bill over the last couple years and, and the interest that he's shown um, on this subject specifically as this problem has grown uh, over the last over the last few years. We know this is a problem. The previous testifiers have laid out in clear detail the problems that exist uh, with, the, with, with this issue. Um, Mr. Bakke did a good job of kind of laying out the statistics. We know that uh, in, in 2021, Minneapolis and St. Paul had 4,000 reported catalytic converter thefts. And this was an almost 10,000% increase from 2018 when there were 40 reported stolen catalytic converters statewide. Um, just shows the, the issue that we're having. Minneapolis and St. Paul now have more catalytic conver converter thefts than the entire country did just a few years back. Uh, a lot of talk about insurance. We estimate um, 
roughly 25 million in insured losses in 2021. Um, this does not include victims who don't have coverage. Uh, in addition to the cost of just the, the catalytic converter, uh, we think about the, the cost of people, you know, with their deductibles, with rental cars, with not having a mode of transportation to get uh, to and from work. Uh, and so we are, uh, we are supportive of, of Senator Marty's work and, and hopefully being able to get to the point this year where this bill advances, um, uh, you know, uh, hopefully a solution that, that cracks down on those, not only in the interest of, of insurance companies and for the losses that we pay out, but for the for the numerous victims uh, that we've seen in this state. So uh, happy to stand for any questions if you have any, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Thank Cocking. You. And lastly, I think we have Mr. Jeremy Estenson. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, my name is Jeremy Estenson. I work for uh, Taft Advisors, a lobbying firm in Minneapolis. And I'm here representing uh, ISRI, which is the Institute of Scrap Recycling Industries. Um, Senator Marty was kind enough to take a meeting with uh, folks from our industry. Um, and we had a nice chat about uh, our uh, joint concern with the problem of catalytic converter theft. And let me be blunt, every catalytic converter that gets stolen and summarily shipped out of Minnesota, which is an important part of this discussion, uh, the vast majority of catalytic converters that get cut off uh, go to a different jurisdiction. I'll explain why in a minute. Um, we, uh, that's a catalytic converter that we might be able to recycle in the future. And of course, uh, recycling is a business these days. Um, you've heard the, the numbers. Catalytic converters are worth a lot. And they're worth a lot because they're made out of platinum, palladium, and rhodium for the most part. Excuse me, Mr. Chair. And those things come from faraway locations, and there's a volatile marketplace. Uh, and um, these things get traded on a, a commodities type of uh, marketplace. And um, Mr. Chair, I think if I could, I'd use an example. Uh, if Senator Duckworth were to want to go recycle anything, catalytic converter, whatever the case may be, drive into a scrapyard in the state of Minnesota, a, a properly licensed scrapyard, uh, a number of things would happen. He would uh, have his car in his license plate videotaped, and that would be retained. Uh, he would then um, hand over his driver's license or his ID. That would be retained. A copy of it would be retained. Uh, he, would be, uh, he would sign an affidavit that says the material that he's selling is his to sell. The material itself would be photographed, weighed, documented, and so forth. And uh, finally, he would be paid in some sort of traceable way, uh, no cash. Um, and all of those things happened because back in 2012, 13, uh, County Attorney Choi was dealing with a very similar situation, but at that time it was copper. Copper and, and, and minivans, to tell you the truth, it was two different types of scrap theft that was going on. It was decimating the community. Um, and unfortunately, it was affecting folks who could least afford to deal with the consequences. And so he brought stakeholders together, law enforcement, uh, scrap metal dealers, and county attorneys, and said, we each have a role to play here. Let's work through it. Uh, this feels very similar. And I'm here to tell you that industry is willing to do their part. Um, we, we shared with Senator Marty some of our concerns. Um, the, the tough part of uh, crime is regulating criminals is pretty tough. And so uh, to ask them to put VIN numbers on a catalytic converter that they intend to take out of Minnesota um, doesn't feel as though it's going to do much to slow the actual crime rate. Now, um, we are willing to do more record keeping, business to business transactions. We're willing to um, uh, look for new penalties to put on bad actors in the industry. Um, but, but you've got this really tough question in front of you, uh, and that is how do you balance uh, crime prevention with uh, you know, freedom to keep commerce going and make sure that recycling is profitable? Because if it's not, it takes 400 pounds of ore to make another catalytic converter. We recycle 30 million of them a year. Um, and we don't want to see that cooled unnecessarily. Um, so, Mr. Chair, I, I, I'll stop there. Um, we've expressed to Senator Marty our concerns, and our hope is that uh, Senator Marty, maybe with the help of the folks who have testified, will bring everyone together to talk about the nuances and complexity that go into um, uh, trying to add new regulations to the recycling world without, um, without having a cooling effect, and at the same time not unintentionally making criminals out of uh, people who have no intent to be criminals. 
Thank you, Mr. Essence, and, and thank you to all the testifiers. Before I go to member questions and comments, are there any further amendments on this? Um, Mr. Chair, Senator I do Martin. have an A8 amendment, which I did not offer at the beginning and didn't intend it to be offered as an author's amendment, which you're accepted basically because it's the initial hearing. And that's an amendment that it's related to this, but it's not quite the same, and I don't want it to be used to tank a bill we've been working on for three years. But um, you can hand out the A8 amendment, but it would simply add um, the fact that in 2013, uh, I think somebody referred to it earlier, the legislature passed a law requiring when people are taking in autos, scrap dealers are taking in autos, the county attorney Choi mentioned this, um, that they have to track it, that we have to make it so we're cracking down on the people, the rogue towing firms who bring them in and crush them. And there was a news report a couple months ago about a woman whose car was stolen and, and she talked to law enforcement, they said they'll try and track the car and next she heard about it was six months later, Department of Public Safety sends her a title stamped, um, junked, your car was trashed. And she's thinking, why was my car trashed? And well, they tracked it down and some towing thing came in, called it abandoned car and sold it to a scrapper and they trashed the car. Anyway, we had a law to deal with that in 2013 and a couple years later, um, the legislature repealed it. It passed with bipartisan support, apparently it was repealed with bipartisan support because they said the database here to put it in, at that time the legislature was asking the department to create a database and it hadn't finished the database yet. So it was repealed and basically right now, this is a related thing, it would use the same database that they're gonna, that the department's gonna approve contract with, they're not building their own. Be the same database, the same thing, only for automobiles um, to stop this from happening. So you don't have your car towed away by somebody who's not supposed to be towing it, selling it. And the industry might say, well, we already have to report it, because they do have, there's a national database they have to report any cars they take in and the VIN numbers and everything else. The difficulty is that that doesn't get shown up for a month and by that time the car is trashed and sold and I mean crushed and everything else. So this would be a simple amendment to use the same thing. And again, I didn't want this to be authored as an author's amendment because I don't want people to support this and then say they're gonna vote against the bill because that's not bur that's inappropriate, but it's very much related. It's the same database, same kind of thing. Instead of the part of the car, it's the entire car. And so I'd urge your support for this. Um, and I have Mr. Baki can speak to that because um, <clears throat> we discussed the nature of the auto theft thing. So I'd, I'd love to have somebody offer the amendment if you feel comfortable with that. Thank you, Senator Marty. Senator Seberger moves the A8 amendment. Members, questions or comments for the A8? Seeing none, oh, Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, question for Senator Marty. Um, Senator Marty, could you talk about just, you know, why have this move in this bill versus a separate bill? Sure. Senator Marty. Um, Mr. Chair, because it's, I mean, we're using the same database that would be created, would be contracted for by the Department of Public Safety, be the same thing where we're trying to stop the stolen part or the stolen auto. Um, it's a bill that's already passed the legislature, became law, was repealed simply because there wasn't a database available at the time, and now there is one that, frankly, pawn shops are using right now. And I'd rather have Mr. Baki speak to how it's being used now, but we would be expecting, and there will be a fiscal note in Senator Latz's committee um, to deal with the costs of this bill, but that would be, they would be contracting with this database, so the database would be existing. Um, I figure if, if it takes three years to get something like this through, I don't want to have it happen for, Another one, this is a smaller issue. I don't think there are as many cars being hit this way. There clearly aren't as many cars being hit this way. There's our catalytic converters, but it's still just, it's basically heavily related. Senator Rasmus. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Marty. Appreciate the response on that. I know you've uh, been working with a number of stakeholders for you know, a number of years on your catalytic converter legislation. I was wondering, um, Senator Marty, on this amendment, you know, have you gotten feedback yet from the you know, scrap metal recycling industries or other stakeholders who might be impacted by it? Senator Mr. Mr. Chairman, no, because this was in law a number of years ago and the reason they gave for repealing it was because there was no database. And, and to me, 
the industry, again, I have not discussed it with them. This only came up a month ago when we heard about this problem and we're hearing from law enforcement on it. And the issue is if they're already reporting it to this national database that takes a month to get reported, just report it the same day in, into this database. All they have to do is put the, the title, I mean, any information they have, the VIN number and everything like that, they put that into the database. So it shouldn't be, it's no extra burden other than you may have to enter the 16 digit code into a different database as well. Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I appreciate it. Thank you, Senator Marty, and, and this might be a very good idea, might make a lot of sense. I'm just a little concerned that if this is an amendment that uh, stakeholders haven't had a chance to vet or discuss with the bill author yet, just to give it some more time, it's my understanding that there is another committee stop um, for this, and so I would just um, you know, think that there's a good conversation that could be had, um, and I just get worried about adopting an amendment when those who are impacted and would have to handle the regulation haven't been uh, talked with yet about it. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I guess I would piggyback off of what Senator Rasmussen shared a little bit, just in the sense that if it was law, has been repealed at some point, now we're looking to make it law again uh, without the potential conversation of stakeholders or understanding fully what we would be looking at. Um, that would give me some cause for pause. I am curious to hear uh, from the special agent, if you wouldn't mind, specific to this amendment, how you, how you envision this playing out or how it would be helpful, if that's okay, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Special Agent. Thank you, Mr. Chair. There's been an increase recently that I've heard from uh, auto theft investigators in Minnesota uh, of an uptick in which what we call rogue tow services, and those are your basically unmarked tow trucks that show up and take a car. Uh, it's suspected that they're responsible for some of the cars that are stolen and, and just are never found again. Uh, those cars fall into this category of either being smushed, um, being entered and um, being ex exported out of the country or, or having their VIN number swapped or something like that. Uh, it, my understanding of, of how this worked is, I'm, and I'm familiar with the old, what they call the APS automated pawn system, which has now been replaced by um, an online company that does this. Uh, they only work through law enforcement. They collect data seamlessly. And my understanding of how it would work essentially is uh, when a person or a tow company brings in a car, they have to provide um, information in order to complete the transaction. That transaction information is entered into the scrap buyer's um, accounting system, if you will. And at the end of the day, when their accounting system, it will seamlessly dump that information into the database. Law enforcement, uh, and I don't know what the logistics will be in terms of how it actually will work out, because it'll be the Department of Public Safety that'll manage and coordinate that, but law enforcement is then able to um, look at it, and as an example, if someone came forward and said, hey, I need to report my car stolen, they reported their car stolen, under the way it currently works, those records would go into a system called Ninvitas, but they won't show up for a period of 30 days, and none of the law, well, Anoka County, none of the other law enforcement agencies in Minnesota check Ninvitas for stolen records. So a long period will transpire until the owner of the car receives the title information that, hey, your car was, was, was junked, here's your junk title. The problem with that is by that time, the car has already been smushed and run through a shredder and you're not getting it back. What this would potentially do is, since it would be happening in an overnight fashion, uh, they would be able to get an alert and presumably you know, go up and recover the stolen vehicle before it's destroyed, um, thereby returning it to, to the, the vehicle owner, which is a big asset to them. Does that answer your question? Senator Duckworth. Uh, it does, Mr. Chair, and I appreciate that. And uh, some of the scenarios that come to mind, I, don't, I guess I don't know how it would play out, is I know oftentimes, unfortunately, if there's a, a vehicle accident, you know, vehicles get towed away, they end up in junkyards or what have you, and sometimes they go unclaimed or they just kind of sit there and uh, a company is forced to kind of get rid of it at some point. So I won't belabor the point. But it seems like there might be some, some value in this, uh, but it also seems like there might be a little bit more more to it, uh, maybe some more questions. So um, whether it's an amendment to this bill, which is very specific in its intent, and I think it's a, it's uh, trying to achieve a very good intent, maybe this uh, being a separate bill that travels on its own, uh, maybe there would be uh, some value to that uh, rather than having it as an amendment to this bill. So uh, I guess that's my take at this point. I appreciate your very helpful information that you provided. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Marty. 
Mr. Chair, um, first of all, I think it is, is as Mr. Baki mentioned, the, it's all done by computers anyway, and it's supposed to be done in a lawful way. Um, I think um, Senator Rasmussen's suggestion is a, I'm happy to, if the committee prefers, to hold the bill over and ask um, when it is heard in the Judiciary Committee to consider the amendment then. That way the industry and others who may have concerns about it can take a look at it and so on. So um, that's fine with me if we want to just I'll withdraw the amendment from for now and I'll, I'll make the intent of introducing it tomorrow then when, or whenever the bill is heard in Judiciary. Thank you, Senator Marty. Senator Seberger withdraws the A6-8 amendment. A uh, so back to the bill, the underlying bill. Questions from the committee or comments? Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, thank you, Senator Marty, for that gesture. I think that'll hopefully uh, uh, add to an even better product by, it's all, by the time it's all said and done. I just have a few questions. Obviously, this is a very significant issue. It's impacting countless Minnesotans. Our law enforcement folks are having to deal with it. Um, and so some of my questions are more aimed at just understanding the problem and how we might go uh, at approaching it. I understand that some work has been done on this in the past. I'm going to reference uh, a report from the Commerce Department that's entitled Automobile Theft Prevention Program 2021. And a part of that uh, report stated that in November of 21, a mini pilot was approved to purchase approximately 1,200 labels at the cost of $10,000. And the labels were distributed to five law enforcement agencies across Minnesota in December of 2021. I'm just wondering if there is any, any feedback or any insight into that program, the results, anything that we learned that's, that's useful to the discussion we're having today. Uh, Commander. Thank you, Senator. Well, I'm the manager of that program. Very good. <laughs> um, the, we, we have ordered approximately 50,000 labels to date. There was also a separate program uh, that was part of the Minnesota Auto Theft Prevention Grant Program that the Minnesota Automotive Dealers Association um, did, and that accounts for about 10,000 of those labels. Uh, the information I can say is, as far as the success or the, the outcome of it, to stay brief, it's more challenging than I thought to get people to put a label on their car. Um, partnering with um, different service centers has proven to be much more successful. And at this point, we've expanded the program uh, beyond the most at-risk uh, vehicles of five or six of them and expanded it to uh, all gasoline vehicles uh, beyond the year 2000. Um, that said, as far as how successful it, it has been, uh, it seems to have a pretty good deterrence effect. Uh, there's an auto dealership up in Coon Rapids that had eight catalytic converter thefts last year before April. Um, they participated with this program. I think they actually purchased some of their own labels because they've been putting them on every vehicle in the, the lot. Um, I spoke to the manager of that dealership last two weeks ago um, to get an update, and she said that they haven't had a single theft since. Um, I have had uh, several anecdotal stories of people who uh, have had their, their cars marked, um, and in some cases, attempts have been made, but they've been abandoned. Uh, and they've attributed those to the fact that their cars have been marked. I can also tell you from the law enforcement perspective when, when I was involved in search warrants this last November um, and other intelligence information that I've gathered, uh, they don't, the, the thieves do not want to buy um, catalytic converters with markings on them. Uh, and that was the, you know, evidenced by the, the one that I showed you that had the grind marks, uh, which was obviously some type of an identification number that was being removed from that converter. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you. That's very helpful. So it, it sounds like uh, in the past an approach has been maybe we uh, give uh, marking mechanisms to the general public, potentially those that have the type of vehicle that's most targeted, and then also auto, auto dealerships. Uh, and it sounds like maybe that has been a more worthwhile endeavor. Is that kind of what you've experienced? Um, are we looking at the dealerships as a potential uh, great place to start in terms of trying to implement this statewide? Um, just trying to look at lessons learned that's really going to help us be as successful as quickly as possible when it comes to this issue. Special Agent Baki. Thank you. Most of the car dealerships uh, were not convinced that the program would be successful and haven't participated. Some of them were provided labels under that pilot and gave them back saying they don't want to do it, they don't think it can do anything. Um, and that, that's even having heard from the other 
you know, car dealership that it has had a significant deterrence effect. Uh, when it comes down to is, is like most crimes, nobody's going to think it's going to happen to them until it does. Uh, so that's and, and Mr. Mr. Chair, that's one of the arguments for this bill. Instead of saying, well, because again, if there was pilot programs, everything else hit, I mean, 50,000 cars is less than 1% of the cars on the road. Um, very little of the impact there. This bill has a different approach. You don't need to have a label on your catalytic converter as long as it's attached to the car. Just look in the windshield, you can find out the VIN number. You take it off the car, you write it on the thing. The only people who have a problem with that, the only people who should have a problem with that are the thieves. Because they put it on, they're telling you whose car they stole it from. They put on a false one, they're breaking the law. They don't put anything on, they're breaking the law. That's the simplicity of this, because it hits immediately. After the law takes effect, it would be, I think it's the effective date is August 1st, I'm assuming. Um, after the law takes effect, if you take a catalytic converter off your car, or if a muffler shop takes it off, you mark it. And it's a simple thing. You don't have to worry about your car. It's only the people taking it off the car who have to worry about it, and the thieves are the ones who we're after, and they will all, I mean, it doesn't do them any good to mark it because they're still, if they put the VIN number on, you're still gonna get them. If they don't put the VIN number on, you're gonna get them. And that's what we're trying to get at. And that's why I think this is a lot smarter and simpler than trying to say, well, we're gonna try and have everybody mark their catalytic converters. Other member questions? I've got a couple more, Mr. Chair, if that's okay. Senator Duckworth. I, I'm curious uh, if that one's marked up there with you, Senator Marty. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it just came from some, no. Yeah, there you go. Um, so a couple of uh, more, maybe more technical questions specific to the bill than some more general ones. I noticed on here it talks about that the converter uh, has to have been issued, has to, the EPA has to certify it for reuse as a replacement part. That's something that somebody has to obtain to be legally compliant with the converter. I'm curious, how does somebody obtain that, or is that something that if the car is sold, it's already kind of assumed to, go ahead. Special Agent Baggy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That's actually an exception to the, the requirement, and that's because there are two um, places in the United States that I'm aware of where they will take um, a used catalytic converter and recertify it for installation on a motor vehicle as a replacement part. One of those happens to be in St. Cloud, Minnesota. Uh, they are coincidentally marking all of their catalytic converters that they sell anyway, so that provision was originally provided um, because of feedback that was received from uh, that industry that they didn't want theirs to be considered unlawful. So that's an exception, not something the general public would have to do. And, so, and Mr. Chair, related to that too, um, this wouldn't be one that EPA would recertify. This would, they would take it off cleanly, not a hacksaw cut to it. Because they want to reuse it. Those are being used for replacement parts. And mm -hmm. EPA has to certify them because of, for the air quality reasons. Thank you, if I may, Mr. Chair. Um, on page uh, six, line 6.15, actually 6.17, it talks about if the person has an official law enforcement report stating that the agency has verified the person's ownership prior to the removal of the converter from the vehicle. So in, in my mind, just as a, a person owning their vehicle, they're taking off their catalytic converter for whatever reason, maybe they've got an old vehicle that's just been hanging out on the property. Are they supposed to then go to their local police department and have it with them and get it documented and that's kind of how they would then be okay to take it someplace and sell it? Mr. Chair, Senator, Senator Duckworth, Marty. this is meant to exactly the situation you have. You have an old car in your, your garage, your barn, wherever it's been sitting there, you cancel the title because it's, it's junked it, but it's still got a catalytic converter on it and somebody tells you this is worth several hundred bucks you might want to take it off, well then you go to the local law enforcement and say, look, I need some evidence that it's my own car, that I'm not stealing it, I just want to get the money from it. That's what it's intended to do, and so we're saying that if they get an official law enforcement, their local law enforcement agency to just say, it's, hey, it's your, cal your catalytic converter, you're taking it off, that's all they need to do to get around it. Because there's no title left, um, they have the VIN number, but they wouldn't have any title or anything. Sorry, okay. Duckworth. Uh, thank you. A little further down, lines 6.27 and 6.30 talk about uh, the scrap metal dealer and what they might be prohibited from doing. For example, uh, they're prohibited from processing, selling, or removing one from a dealer's premises for at least seven days after they've purchased or acquired it. 
uh, and that the payment for it must not be made until at least five days after the sale to the scrap metal dealer. Um, I'm curious to, to hear the, the reasoning behind that and, and I'm trying to understand the practicality of that as, as a business owner. I, I can probably make some guesses as to why it's there, but just curious to hear from someone that's dealing with this on a, on a regular basis, the thought behind that portion of the bill. Special Agent. Thank, thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, the, pur the purpose of the first provision is a holding period so that if law enforcement um, are looking for a particular catalytic converter or person, uh, they don't go to recover the property and find out it's already been disposed of. Uh, that's in place in many of the, the pawn laws that are across the nation and, and many, I believe it's locally registered and are regulated in Minnesota. Uh, the second purpose of the delayed payment um, is to uh, deal with the, the, the target audience of, of people who are going out and stealing uh, catalytic converters often um, at the scrapyard or meeting with their black market buyer the very first thing the next morning, uh, frankly, in order to get cash so they can go get drugs. And so this delay should create a deterrence effect on that. Plus, it also helps to deal with the situation of that way you don't have a, uh, if the police show up to and say, hey, this is stolen, uh, this, the scrapyard isn't in the spot of, well, we already paid this guy and now we're the ones out the money. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Regarding the, the fiscal note and the, the BCA agent that would be involved in this, my, my question is, I guess, just more ge uh, generic, specific to, I guess, maybe the target audience. If you're looking at uh, an agency like the BCA, um, I'm just curious if any consideration or any dialogue has taken place to additional funds that would create a task force specific to, uh, we, you know, somebody mentioned sting operations earlier, but somebody that's maybe looking at what's being posted on Craigslist or Facebook and actually attempting to uh, go after those that are perpetrating these crimes, taking these from vehicles, and, uh, you know, more of a dual approach, stopping it there and also through the, the marking uh, system and mechanism of enforcement that you're talking about as well. To the author or special agent? Mr. Chair, just real briefly, I think that some of that market will dry up because, again, I'm, law enforcement agencies don't have unlimited personnel to go out and do sting operations and so on. But if, if they hear, if somebody's, if somebody's selling catalytic converters in, in a big supermarket parking lot, we'll meet you there this time in the morning and buy your converters. I mean, you look at Craigslist and um, Facebook Marketplace, and one of the scrap dealers a year or two ago, cash for converters and all kinds of things, you know, it's, it's very clearly making, facilitating making this happen. And we're trying to say by limiting it to who, who can buy it and how, the law enforcement, if they feel there's a, a renegade business or something in it, they can crack down on it, they can do a sting operation, whatever they want. Um, I think a lot of this will help just by making it a crime to possess without, without a VIN number. On it. I mean, that alone and some of the other things in this, I think it all works together well. Would it be helpful if we have more? Hey, if, if this isn't doing as much as we hoped and providing funding for sting operations or something might be desirable, I think this is going to have a huge, make a huge dent in the problem. Senator Doc? Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for that answer. One of the things I understand regarding this issue is sometimes we have, you have great states like the state of Minnesota, which is doing its part, especially in terms of some of the scrapyard regulations and even some of the things that they're willing to do on their own. Uh, but that's not, that's not the case in all states. Uh, you might have a neighboring state, which is much more lax in terms of how they handle these situations, especially when they show up at a scrapyard. So I'm wondering if, if uh, the Department of Commerce or others are looking at this issue jointly with some of our neighboring states or other states where this has also been an issue so that we can, you know, not only do our part in Minnesota, but then still see these things being stolen, but driven across the border into Wisconsin, for example, and uh, maybe still not getting at the root of the issue here. Senator Martin. Mr. Chair, I'll, I'll say that um, Special Agent Baki has been presenting to law enforcement conferences around the country on this, encouraging other states to do similar things, and I think that's that's what we ought to be doing. I mean, some things this could be done by federal law. Um, if we do this, it has a real dent in the problem. Other states will copy it too. 
I mean, I think the auto theft investigators said that this would be a good model for other states to look at. Sir uh, Last question. Um, could you explain to me what meets the definition in terms of a marking mechanism? Um, we've talked about permanent markers. We've talked about maybe actually physically um, drilling it on there. We've talked about stickers. And my question is, if the, if the method or mechanism of labeling is fairly simple, it, would it be easy to potentially sidestep and evade um, the purpose behind marking them? So just looking for some insight there, what you've encountered and how we're gonna make sure that the, the actual labeling of these will meet the intent of the bill. Senator Marty. I'll, I'll have Mr. Baki answer, <laughs> but the Agent labels Baki. have to be immediately accessible to law enforcement, <laughs> immediately be able to connect them to the VIN number for the vehicle. In other words, markings have to be law enforcement able to detect immediately, this is the VIN number. So if it's not the VIN number, it has to be a comparable thing in effect. The, the marking of it would be up to the choice of the person who removed the catalytic converter. And, and I would suggest you'd have to use some method that you're going to be confident in. The number is going to be there long enough until it's out of your possession. Uh, if, if, you know, if, if I had were to do one in my garage, which would be beyond my abilities, um, you know, the point is, but I assume I'd bring it to the scrapyard in the next day or two, so I'd probably pull out a Sharpie and write it on there with a Sharpie. Um, it, there are other, you know, labels and, you know, methods people can use. Uh, when, when a car is disassembled by a, a recycler, one of the first things they do is they have a sheet of labels, and as their employees take, you know, the headlights off and everything, they put the labels on it so they can track the VIN number. I assume they would just have a, a comparable label that, that goes on the catalytic converters as they remove them. Uh, so that would be, you know, kind of an industry choice of whatever mechanism they, they choose. Uh, and, and the other part about the law, we didn't speak to it a lot, but um, for places dealing in high volumes of cars, or, or anyone is, they don't have to put the full VIN. They have to put a, a number that makes it so if a law enforcement officer um, shows up to do that inspection, or the, the Department of Public Safety does, and they have 10 catalytic converters or 100, it could have an inventory label on it and say part A1, and then the, they can pull up through their inventory, okay, that came off of this car, as long as they can track it back. Senator Duckworth. Thanks. I guess just one follow-up to that. So if they can track it back to a car, um, that's great, but at what point can they determine that it was not lawfully taken from that vehicle? Uh, is that somewhere in the database? Has that been registered? I'll give you an example. Let's say somebody, they steal one of these things. Uh, somehow they mark it. Let's say they even are able to see what the VIN of the vehicle is, and they write it on there, they take it to a scrapyard, uh, and then somebody checks the VIN number and it registers to a vehicle. Is at that point in time, has the, the person done their due diligence in accepting that catalytic converter? Uh, or what triggers, a what triggers a mechanism of saying this was unlawfully obtained and now you're, you're looking at potential criminal issues, or is the sole purpose really just to deter and hope that we don't ever get to that point because we have these things labeled? Special Agent Baki. So when you're selling a, a single catalytic converter, um, you're going to need to have some type of proof of ownership, whether it's the registration or the title or that report from a law enforcement agency. The, you know, the registration of the title is going to have the VIN number on it, which should match the VIN number of the the catalytic converter that you have. Uh, scrap dealers, when they're purchasing catalytic converters, are going to be very much aware of what vehicle that came from because that's how they determine the value. So it, it, as an example, we'll keep picking on Prius because they're, they're really popular. Um, if you have a Prius catalytic converter, um, you're going to have to have a title or registration document for an equivalent vehicle. And that's going to be really difficult for you to be bringing in 17 of them. Um, so, you know, yes, if you're the, if you have some legitimate titles, um, you could go out and target those, you know, Pacific vehicles, but that's, we're talking about a very minority of the folks. And then the other aspect of the database is like the old pawn system. You could have alerts for suspicious activity like that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Other questions and comments from the committee? Seeing none, the question is on the motion of Senator Latz that Senate File 5, as amended, be recommended to pass and referred to the Committee on Judiciary and Public Safety. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say no. The motion prevails. 
Senate File 5, as amended, is recommended to pass and is referred to the Committee on Judiciary and Public Safety. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Thank you, Senator Marty. There being no further business before the committee, we are adjourned.